It is a struggle felt and fought by many people across the country. All of us have mental health issues, just as some degrees are more, more, more worse than others. Each person's battle is unique to their own experiences. I had an eating disorder for years, and I didn't even have social media. This week, we bring you the stories of how people are doing in their challenges and the lessons they've learned in hopes of helping others. We love on them until they can love on themselves. This is The Race. Welcome to The Race, I'm Chris Stewart. Social media is part of our lives that stretches far beyond just staying in touch with friends. It can be an essential part to staying connected to the entire world. That can make it difficult for people who struggle with issues of mental health. And experts say this pandemic has only made the problem worse. Social media is meant to be where we're always connected. But away from her screen, Danielle Konsky says she was in a place far lonelier. Posting a picture and maybe not getting the amount of likes you, you wanted and then taking it out on your body. Danielle was in high school when she first started to struggle with an eating disorder, but reached the most critical point in college. I was limiting my food intake. I was comparing to girls I was friends with. I was 82 pounds when my mom was like, you know, you, <laughs> that's not healthy, that's not normal. Danielle says for her, social media was a trigger. I think a huge thing for me was the opinion of males and you know if they liked my pictures or if they Snapchatted me and what that meant about me. There seems to be such a need on our helpline to have support for, uh, for young people who have been home during the pandemic, um, very isolated in their homes and focused on social media. Lynn Slosky is with Anon. Her organization's helpline connects people struggling, like Danielle had, with resources and organizes support groups in hopes of helping the estimated 30 million Americans with an eating disorder. This isn't going to go away. The sort of put your phone down approach I don't think is, is going to help necessarily. Annie Margaret is searching for a better way to introduce young people to life online. The instructor with the Atlas Institute at the University of Colorado Boulder is hosting a digital wellness program next summer for students between 11 and 18 years old. Any older, she says they can already be hooked. It's really that awareness of what is my feed full of and how is that making me feel and what could I change to really make this a tool for connection with people that I truly care about. Social media platforms say they're working on features to protect users who may be struggling with issues of body image. You can now choose to hide likes on your Instagram account. That has also been helpful for me in seeing other people put the like count off because it really just shows like why is it there to begin with and what do likes mean and, and what even is the attainable number for that. I would hope that all adults understand that it's so meaningless. It's so irrelevant. It has so much impact on you where it's nothing. There is no perfect manual to parenting, especially when it comes to social media. I try to educate myself a lot because I'm Danielle's source of comfort. Danielle says she's worked with therapists and nutritionists to get to a healthier place today. I think I've always wanted to be a helper before my struggles. Um, and, you know, experiencing that and coming out of it, it's just, I feel like a purpose to do that. She's now studying at Columbia University to become a mental health counselor to help others struggling in a world where social connection is often searched for online. Many people facing addiction and substance use disorders also struggle with mental health. Now the resources meant to help those people are changing. Vanessa Mashanya shows us how it's impacting one person's recovery. As stark and as isolating as a rural winter can feel. Similarly, the pandemic has been a harsh two years for people living with addiction. We are seeing more and more people struggle with their recovery. Peter Eppenshade of Recovery Vermont has seen the human toll of the dire statistics plaguing his community and the rest of the country. From March 2020 to March 2021, Vermont saw 211 drug overdose deaths, the largest percentage increase of any state at 85%. Nationally, 
nationally, overdose deaths increased 35 percent. However, what this time of isolation and lost connections has done is emphasize the need for the type of recovery their team and others have been working to perfect. Once we started pairing that sobriety with real connections to a meaningful life, we've seen great success. Just as people rely on their neighbors to help get through hard country winters, Recovery Vermont is helping to build a village around people living with addiction, starting with recovery coaches, strategically placed in emergency departments and centers in every county. It's a system that the state government has bought into and is showing results. People can recover once we give them a kind of bespoke suite of tools that they help identify, not that we do. And if it takes a village of support to help someone into recovery, one family is trying to turn the financially struggling town of Johnson, hit hard by the opioid crisis, into an entire recovery-focused community. Our daughter Jenna um, was 26 when we lost her to an overdose, um, which really just threw our family and our community in turmoil. After immense tragedy, Dawn and Greg Tatro channeled their hurt into creating solutions to the same issue that took their daughter Jenna from them, fixing the flaws in the system they believe could have saved her life, calling their organization Jenna's Promise. We'll see where we are in five years, but we uh, really feel like we're going to be saving a lot of lives. At the center is Jenna's house, a church turned recovery center. There's a counselor based here, a nurse practitioner, a huge space where all kinds of daily meetings happen. There's also a family program for parents in recovery that offers babysitting. It just happened that the price of the church was the same exact price as Jenna's life insurance policy. So that's why we call it Jenna's house, because it really is her house. She bought this house. Outside Jenna's house, the Tatros are buying up abandoned storefronts and turning them into housing and employment opportunities, including a soon-to-be roastery where people will be guaranteed jobs. I think part of the best thing is when people say, no one else has ever believed in me. Even as COVID-19 has severed connections in so many ways, Peter believes the will of neighbors to help each other through the darker seasons will continue to fuel the progress being made in recovery. We finally come up with a theory of change, which is connection, one that's evidence-based, one that we know works, and another huge wall has been put up for us through COVID. But what are we going to do, give up? No, we're going to keep hammering on this proven path. I'm Vanessa Michon, you're reporting. In centers across the country, people are helping others get through their darkest moments. Since the pandemic, call reason for um, anxiety and depression have increased pretty dramatically. The things these crisis hotline workers say keep them motivated to help. You're watching The Race.